everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a job for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. They say ever since he lives on a lily pad and eats flies. <laughs> a frog. <laughs> Beats Arnold Burgers. <laughs> Even in the Twilight Zone, I still got it. <laughs> hey, guys. How do you get in a coffin? It's easy getting in. Getting out's the hard part. <laughs> Even in Paddock, I've still got it, huh? <laughs> Doing something, Leather? You may have a nail in your heel, but you've got a lot of soul. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got it. I've still got it! Yes, even in retirement, I still got it. <laughs> uh, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. We're not retired yet, and uh, this is Douglas Viviani with uh, our very own Fonzie himself, David Cohen. <laughs> Far from it, but yeah, happy to be here, Doug. Oh, you're wearing the white T-shirt, so there's a start. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> We're excited this week because we are going to take a look yes. back at a tremendous show from the 70s that celebrated the 50s, Happy Days, and you heard a little piece of Ralph Mouth there. We've got uh, Don Most himself here on Everything Old is New Again. We are going to enjoy talking about music, talking about maybe a little uh, about acting, a little bit about an emergency, Chips, Baywatch, Love Boat, Star Trek, Voyager maybe, Diagnosis, Murder, Charles in Charge, Glee, so many things that he's done as well as his singing career we're gonna have a great time uh enjoying our time with ralph mouth himself i guess we could say but uh more importantly don most don thank you very much for spending time with us here on everything old is new again oh thank you for having me good to be with you that's great to hear because uh we're we've been fans of yours for a while and and of happy days and it's on me tv now by the way if anybody's looking for it you can see it on uh on reruns and it, it holds up and it's a great show now it wasn't an instant hit although i really enjoyed the early seasons i know david did as well but once fonzie henry winkler caught fire uh you know interacting with you and the rest of the cast at one point uh, this the the studio or, or the powers that be wanted to call the show Fonzie's Happy Days, and Ron Howard was not a fan of doing that. I'm not so sure if you were a fan of that either. How did that uh, that play out on the set? Uh, it wasn't uh, Henry Winkler's idea, but that was something that was floated. So, uh, did, did that affect the crew and or you know the production of the show in any way, or the feelings between the actors? No, not really, because it never really got any traction and uh, because i think it was a combination of uh ron uh, you know the great respect that we all had for each other and and ron and henry very much so and um i think henry was was very uh sensitive to to the fact of how, how that could be uh disruptive and and maybe not the right thing to do and and I, yeah and i think ron was not uh you know that's not what he'd signed on for and um i mean in terms of whether henry's character got big or not that 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 ron didn't have any problem with that but but changing the name of the show midstream and and doing that it just didn't feel right and uh henry and ron agreed on that so it never really went anywhere um and it so it didn't affect us and i i mean sure we were all certainly aware of when Henry's character became huge. You know, he was the biggest thing on television and, um, you know, there were only three networks on them. There was no internet, there was no cable. So, you know, we'd have 50, 60 million people watching on Tuesday nights. <laughs> so, so um, and then when he became, and we became number one, um, and then his character was so huge. So that happened and, and we were all, thrilled and and you know the show went on and there were no problems but um it could have yeah i I guess it could have if if it had gone in a different direction if if henry and ron weren't the the gentlemen that they were 
Right, there could have been some at odds, so to speak, and and trying to vie over roles and who's going to be the most important character, and and that happened. Yeah. I mean, just to, we we just know behind the scenes with Star Trek with uh, Spock and and Captain Kirk, so to speak, uh, Nimoy and Shatner, especially Shatner, you know, kind of had that and and made the set a little bit uncomfortable for people. So uh, with an ensemble show like yours, as it was described and has been described by Ron Howard, you know, each party. Yeah, you've got this one great character, let's say, or one standout character, but these other characters are just as important because they need to set up uh, that other character, and or you need to have a backstory and a story yourself. It's not all just Fonzie, and and you, I think, did that very well, where you were able to develop your character, and uh, you know, you sang a little bit on the show, and you interact with Fonzie as a you know a foil, if you will, and and so I think that 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 had to take some talent. But the real question I have is, um, obviously the writers are aware of what's going on on the set or apparently aware and saw the reaction to Fonzie but your character got a nice reaction too you had your own catchphrase as we just heard and had your part on the show so what is it something that actors need to do to uh, sort of promote themselves behind the scenes with the writers or are you just you know sort of letting your character develop uh, through just the writing itself or does how much input in this particular situation did you have have into the development of the backstory and the continuation of stories involving your client, not just Fonzie and your <laughs> your character. Yeah, um, well, we did have we did have input, um, especially uh, early on. You know, you mentioned the early seasons; they were one camera shows. Uh, we were not in front of an audience. We were shooting um, every day, sort of like a movie, um, out of sequence and just little bits and pieces, like a movie shot. And uh, we had a, an amazing director, Jerry Paris, and uh, Jerry was very um, open to ideas and um, sort of spontaneous things that might come up. And he would have ideas. And what happened was I, my character at the very beginning was pretty small, very peripheral. You know, I'd have a couple of lines in one scene, a couple of lines in the other, you know, crack a few jokes and say some sarcastic remarks. and. And that you know, and that was pretty much it. But um, so, I would, I would, since I didn't have that much, I would come up with ideas that I thought might, you know, be good to interject to to make it a little more than what it was because it wasn't that much. And Jerry would like my ideas, and and it would it would sort of uh, be a catalyst for him to get ideas. It would spur him on, and then we wind up putting stuff in. He go, yeah, let's do that, and then we could. And so we would create things that, you know, based on some ideas that I started with and, and we'd shoot them, you know, and then and they went over well in the right. And the producers, Gary Marshall liked them and the writers liked it. So then they would start picking up on what we were doing and writing a little bit more in that direction. And then, so that kept happening. And so my character and, and Jerry was a, was a mentor for me. You know, he was a fan. He really liked what I was doing and, and he he had a lot to do, I think, with the fact that my character started to grow because um, he was open to it, and so was so were the producers. So it evolved and it kept growing. And you know, by the middle of the first season, um, or late, especially late in the first season, my character became more of an integral uh, part of. You know, he wasn't just what a guy sort of on the side. I was became one of the gang, especially by season two. Um, for sure. So um, it, it grew, you know, and then like the catchphrase that you talked about, I still got it. Um, that was not in the script. That was something I brought. What happened was um, Jerry used, he was more, I was not like my character in real life. I was not a jokester. I was pretty, I was, I was always the straight guy for my friends when I was in high school that, you know, they were the jokesters. I was pretty intro kind of quiet and shy and all that um but to me the joy of acting is playing roles that are very different than myself so um so but jerry was very much he he loved to crack jokes and and score you know and and really score get people laughing and and he that was his phrase when he really scored with us he would he would turn and look at us and go i still got it you know something like that so one day uh, we were doing a scene in Arnold's, and I remember going over to Ron Howard and saying, um, there was a scene where Ralph was going to do a joke. And um, 
I said, I'm going to say something that's not in the script. You know, we're shooting in front of an audience and all that. I said, just be prepared. I want to, I'm going to say something that's not in there. I didn't even want to tell them what it was. I didn't tell anybody. And then Ralph cracked the joke. And then I put in the, I still got it. I still got it. And they, Jerry went crazy, loved it. The, the audience liked it, even though they didn't, weren't in on the joke. But then that's how that phrase started. And then they started putting it in, you know, more and more. And so, worked. yeah, I mean, we had input and, and, and there was a lot of, evolution for all the characters really and, and there was there's not a lot of shows that do that so it's interesting that you're on a show that was allowed you to do that we'll talk more with don most from happy days and more things including lost heart a movie that's coming out this fall a tv series uh that you can get on youtube of uh, viral vignettes we'll be back right at this and everything old is new again rock, we're gonna rock around the clock tonight but it's bad, bad show. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Johnny now is a singer, uh, and he, he's now taking on a persona. He was like a, really, like Frank Sinatra. Did. Yes, that line forms on the right face of the Mackey. Uh, not James Darren, but that would be Don Most. Bobby, was, Bob, <laughs> Don, not Bobby Darren. Not James Darren either. Uh, <laughs> we're here with Don Most. Everything old is new again. David Cohen. Great to uh, hear that singing, that vocal uh, vocalization. I really enjoyed that. And uh, before we get into that, David Cohen, did you have a, a question uh, for, for Don that uh, you were looking at? Uh, yeah, well, I, d I just wanted to ask, you know, Happy Days was so iconic and such a big part of my life and, and Doug's as well. So we went to high school together. Um, and, and that's when it was at its peak. So it was, you know, must see TV every week, especially the first few seasons. And Doug and I were jokesters in high school. So we identified with Ralph <laughs> Mal to a, to a great extent. And I think you, you sort of answered the, the question in the prior segment, but uh, you know, I was just curious to know how much of that Ralph Mouth character yeah. Was you Don, and 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 yeah. how much was it acting? If if a lot of it was acting, you did a great job because you oh. seem like such a funny. You'd be such a funny guy. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't like that, you know. Especially in high school, even more. So I mean, when we started doing the show, I was twenty. So maybe I had come out of my shell a little bit. But I was, you know, I was pretty serious about acting, and um, most of the roles that I had gotten initially when I first came. I, I was pursuing it from the time I was pretty young in New York. Um, and then when I came out to L.A., the first couple of roles I got were dramatic roles. Um, uh, one on Emergency, where I played a guy that, that was in a car accident, became paralyzed. I did a police story where I played like a psycho, mad bomber, you know. Um, so I was much more, I was really, uh, my, big, my big idol then as an actor was Nicholson, Jack Nicholson, who I he had just done five easy pieces mm -hmm. and um, Easy Rider and um, and Paul Newman and those kind of guys. And so I was really interested in dramatic stuff. Um, but then when this role came up, you know, it was like, yeah, well, I can do comedy if the, if the material's good. So to me, that's what it was all about. It was just playing. And then I knew guys like that. I wasn't like that, but, <laughs> but I knew guys like that in high school. So I would kind of you know, borrow from different people and and try to sort of me meld them into some, pot, you know, like a concoction and um, and from the written material that they gave me, you know, right. so it was a combination of that. And then, like I said, working, having ideas and then Jerry Paris would have an idea and then Gary Marshall, so when he became more involved in the, um, because the first two years, we didn't see Gary as much as we did after that. And then he would have great ideas for everybody. So, um, but anyway, no, I was not, I mean, there's certain aspects of my own personality that are probably similar, but the main part of Ralph, I was 
pretty much 180 degrees. The wow. Opposite. <laughs> and meanwhile, you and, affected and us. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Performing when the when the show switched to being filmed in front of a live audience, how did that impact you in terms of your character or what what you brought to it? That's a really good question because I remember it impacted everything. Um, going from sort of that more low key, subtle uh, way of uh, approaching the material when it's one camera, like like you said, like a movie, then all of a sudden you're in front of an audience. It's more proscenium, like a theater almost a theater environment so as by, by the nature of it it got bigger everything got a little bit broader and heightened because you're playing to an audience they wrote the script they wrote the stories a little bit in, a, in that way i remember they brought in some writers early on Lowell gans um and mark rothman who had been writing on the odd couple another live live audience show so Everything got a little bit broader. I remember it really affected Henry was very uh, almost concerned, you know, really worried. Because if you remember in the first two seasons, his character was so low key and let's say efficient with words. He didn't he did a lot with it, with a look or with a, a gesture, the thumbs up. Um, and he was a man of few words. And that was, made him so cool. Because he didn't have to say that much. He just he had such you know influence over every every situation by not having to say that much. So now all of a sudden he's in a situation where the dialogue became much heavier for everybody. It was you know much, it was much more like a play or something, and and bigger. So he was worried: Are people gonna accept? the cool is he still going to be as cool and all that you know so we were every it was affecting all of us in terms of it changed the characters and if you look at those first two seasons and then look from third season on you definitely could see the difference right yeah, absolutely and uh and, and speaking of, of that uh, i just wanted to turn a, a little bit twist a little bit because we've we introduced to you singing mac the knife there and of course that was bobby darren and and i'm hearing that sinatra and bobby darren are your two faves if you had to see one so to speak in concert now if you only had to pick one between sinatra i don't know dean martin sammy davis the whole group there bing crosby it, it would be bobby darren i'm presuming and if that's the case or well, sinatra why and and what's uh the turn on by uh that uh, yeah. performer all right good. great question um i was lucky enough to to see uh bobby at the copacabana twice when i was 18. i saw sammy davis um in tahoe at a, a caesar's or something like that and i saw sinatra in vegas um you know all of them were my heroes and loved them all and dino and nat king cole and so many and a bunch of others you know some of the great jazz singers that that were back then. There was something about Bobby that was, a, he was fat, he was amazing. He could sing almost any style of music. I mean, his range in terms of the, what he could do vocally and styles was more than any of those guys. You know, he could sing, he could sing the, the big band and the nightclub thing, but he could do folk, he could do blues, he could do gospel, he could do Aunt Bob Dylan, he could do anything. And on stage, Sammy was like, the, you know, was an incredible performer where he could play all different instruments and dance. Bobby did, did dance a little, not like Sammy, but he played, he could play piano and guitar and drums, do impressions. You know, he was an all around uh, entertainer, but he, he was just so magnetic. He had something that, you know, from an early age got to me um, and I was just a huge fan. I mean, obviously Sinatra was, was one of the greatest ever, and but it was a... They each had their thing, and I'll tell you a great story. And when I got to see Sammy Davis, I was lucky enough they asked me, somebody came up to me in the middle of the show and said, Sammy would love for you to come back to the dressing room after to say hello. I was like blown away that, you know, because the show was hot then, and, uh, you know, I, I, wow, Sammy wants me to come back. I couldn't believe it. So I was excited, and I was talking to him about music and Oh, because I loved Sammy. I had all of his albums, too. And I said to him, you know, at one point I said, you know, Sammy, you know who I uh, also loved was I was a huge fan of Bobby, you know, Bobby Darren. And, and he just looked at me. He didn't say anything for about 10 seconds. And he said, the only performer that I would not follow was Bobby Darren. Wow. That says that a lot. That tells you something. Yeah. That, wow. that, that's, that's why. And I got to see Bobby, you know, and. 
So people, he was as, as successful as he was, he was still so underrated, very underrated. And so I do a lot of Bobby stuff when, when I perform, you know. I mean, it's it's all over. It's not just Bobby, but there's definitely a component that I'll do because uh, I just loved what he did so much. And and from that era, and you're you're doing a great job. You could see a peek into that. You can go to a YouTube channel and let's see that here and there. But when we get out of this this pandemic situation, we're all out and about. Uh, you know, take a look at Don Most. I believe you got a, a website there that you can see and announce where you're presenting your your next shows. I don't know if that's going to happen, but we've, yeah, we've got to get there. Soon. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's it's, yeah, it's well worth it. Yeah, DonnyMost.com, and then I'm on Facebook as Don Most, and, and I usually post about all that stuff. Which is great, so we want to get to that. Also, we want to talk a little bit about, our, our, and in the next section we'll get into some current projects like MF, MBF, Man's Best Friend, a role that is totally different for Don Most. You'll see him as a defense attorney defending uh, a vet that's on Amazon Prime. We will be back uh, to talk about that and more, including uh, there's other things like something like a CD, if we're talking about music, Mostly Swinging. I'm sure you can get that out there on Amazon and out and about it's well worth it if you enjoyed hearing what you just heard and the stories behind the songs and the feelings you're going to enjoy mostly swinging with don most and it's uh d most <laughs> is that the name how do we define that how do we call that title the title is it d most it's, mostly swinging yeah yeah on the cover of the cd it's d most mostly swinging there you go all right we'll be back right at this and everything old is new again i think it's about time that we do a waltz a waltz oh come on rich i don't want to do oh how we did You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Hey, you got chocolate on my peanut butter. You got peanut butter on my chocolate. That was good. It's really good. Yeah, I like this. Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. There we go. We're back here on Everything Old is New Again with David Cohen, Douglas Viviani, and that... Is a blow back from the past. What would we say? Don Most is uh, acting there in a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup commercial with none other than Robbie Benson, the voice of the Beast and Beauty and the Beast. And we've got Don Most with us. Do you remember that commercial? That must have been way back when, huh? I do remember it. Oh, yeah. I was, I think, about 18. So it was two years before I went out to L.A. and started doing And when I got Happy Days, about two years prior shot that in new york city and that was memorable to this day for me because every every easter and halloween it's it's reese's peanut butter cup around here oh, yeah. so. <laughs> now we're talking about your singing and your performing and we want to talk a little bit just for a moment about some current things we could see you in and i know you've yeah. got a movie coming out called lost heart this fall maybe uh, give us a little bit of an intro about that and then i want to talk about uh mbf yeah uh, lost heart so it was a beautiful script, um, and I was really uh, excited to do it. It's it's about takes place. We shot it in Michigan, and takes place in beautiful area in northwest Michigan on the lake there, and uh, near the lake. And it's about a, a a woman who ran away from there when she was young, and went to Nashville to, to pursue her dreams of becoming a you know a singer and we see now that she's a huge star and uh, she had ran away partly to get away her, her dad was kind of abusive and all that so now she's a huge star but her life is a is a mess you know all the things that go along sometimes with stardom have affected her she finds out her dad dies and she's going back for the funeral and kind of has to come to terms with her past and all that and i play a small town local pastor in the project so i'm very involved in the film in terms of trying to help her and involved with some of the other characters. It's a drama comedy. There's, there's a lot of fun things in it. it the UFOs are part of it, Bigfoot, and 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 yet there's this and great relationships. Uh, Victoria's, um, Victoria Jackson is in it uh, from SNL, and she's great in it. And I'd worked with her before, and I love working with her. And the other actors are all 
first rate. It was really a great experience. So I'm looking forward. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I heard it came out great. All right, so we're looking for that, and we're going to try to promote that when it comes out for sure. We'll let you know. And then there's another that's out right now, some new entertainment, and it's time to you know kind of focus on and see if there's any new entertainment while we're going through this time. And this is new, and this is exciting. Amazon Prime, man's best friend. You play an attorney. I'm an attorney by profession, so I'm going to uh, listen very carefully here to your uh, presentation <laughs> of uh, basically what is this about and what was it like to get into the head of an attorney it's about a wounded vet he he was in a marine in afghanistan and his part he, he was a dog handler so his dog was like his partner and and um hit an explosive device the dog gets killed he's he's messed up you know he, he's got post stress disorder and all that and he's also even affected brain injury type thing so he's 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 all he's all there but you know he talks funny and and he's a little bit off and and so so he's trying to acclimate back into into society and something happens which i won't tell you um that happens to him and it's it's a really bad situation unfortunate and then he gets um arrested and he's going to go on trial and he needs an attorney and i play uh a guy who's who gets assigned to his case i'm working for a small nonprofit that helps wounded vets and so i get assigned and I was once a successful attorney, but now I'm kind of down from personal problems, alcohol. And um, but I get assigned to this case and it takes on gets a lot of attention. So um, getting into getting into that, the, the script, it was so well written, you know, and I've known some attorneys over the years. And I've certainly uh, I haven't been in the courtroom a lot, but I've seen a lot of movies of, of that and, and knowing people and then just putting myself in that situation of I got I got so engrossed in the story and the other actors were so good and the director was, was so good that I just and, and we shot in this in this um, historic uh, historic courthouse in um, Owasso, Michigan. You felt like you were walking back in time and you just you walk in that courtroom and you just you just feel the history and and it and I just allowed myself to be taken over by it, you know, and lose yourself in it. And it came out, it was really, I'm very happy with it. It came out really well. I'm looking forward to it, that's for sure. It's uh, Man's Best Friend. Uh, you can find that on Amazon Prime. And I'll tell you, that uh, might be something I'm going to watch this weekend, that's for sure. Because look at this good, good, solid, new entertainment, and that's there for us, that's for sure. It's, it's also on Tubi if, if people don't have a Amazon Prime. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I'm going to play a little clip of a gentleman that I'm um, throwing you back. You mentioned The Odd Couple. You mentioned uh, Gary Marshall. And yeah. uh, he's a gentleman that's a, what would we say, is someone that is David and I, we're, we're fans of, I guess the best way to say it. The special tonight is Moose Burgers. The horns are extra. <laughs> Just lost my appetite. Ah, you'll love my moose burgers. They go down very nicely. Yes, but do they stay down? <laughs> Yeah, that's Murray the Cop, and also that's a, an actor, of course, by the name of uh, Al Molinaro, and he was in, of course, Happy Days uh, after the original Arnold, right? Pat Mur yeah, Arnold, played by Pat Morita. Right, and so I have to ask, because I never hear anyone talk about, uh, you know, Al Molinaro, who started acting much later in life, when I understand was a real estate tycoon before he started acting, but was so memorable is, as Murray the Cop and as Al on Happy Days, and became a regular in the show while you were there, I believe a little bit so yeah, did yeah. you have some interactions with him any behind the scenes gives a little peek into just i hate to ask this kind of a question but you're the only one that i can ask what what uh, was he like to work with as a gentleman al was a wonderful guy a sweetheart of a guy you know just such a big heart and and easy to work with and uh, you know he and naturally just very funny you know he just had his his expressions and his personality was such that uh he was so endearing just just a joy to work with um uh you know we certainly had scenes with him at arnold's almost every episode you know there'd be something with al and he was great 
just um, a, a wonderful, wonderful guy. And, and brought over there from The Odd Couple by Gary Marshall, I presume. And we mentioned Gary Marshall a little bit and Jerry Paris. Uh, and the few minutes we have, I know it's not easy, but uh, you know, Gary Marshall, we know from so many things, directed Pretty Woman, Lord Vernon Shirley, of course, uh, adopted the, the script for uh, you know The Odd Couple for TV, created Happy Days and so forth. And he was a writer on The Dick Van Dyke Show. And then, of course, Jerry Paris was an actor yeah. and then later director on Dick Van Dyke Show. So uh, it's sort of a small family there and they knew each other what was um and you know what's the fascination we always hear and you gave us a little peek about jerry paris we could talk about that a little bit too but what's the fascination with and 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 great words that we hear from everybody about gary marshall and jerry paris and and we've seen the product but behind the scenes did you see the i guess i'll use the word genius or the you know the the way these people worked and and did they pass could they pass something along to us how they were so successful in what they did yeah, um, definitely. They they did have that great history together. You know, Gary uh, was a writer on Dick Van Dyke and then became maybe one of the main writers. Uh, Jerry started off the first year, at, you know, just as as uh, the next door neighbor. But I think he told them right from the beginning, as I remember Jerry telling me, he wanted the chance to direct. And he had uh, he'd acted in a lot of films over the years. Marty with Ernest Borgnine, he had a big part. He was in the Kane Mutiny. I mean, he was in a lot of movies, but he wanted to direct. So uh, they, they gave him the opportunity. He observed and, you know, all that. And then by the second year, he, he, he it was his first year directing and he won the Emmy for best director for uh, t- TV comedy that year. And Jerry was, they both were brilliant. Jerry was a brilliant, he had a brilliant comedic mind, very inventive. He, you know, could see what, he he allowed the actors to bring their thing, but then he and he wanted to see what they would do, and then he would he would see something that we would go, wow, what a great idea! Where'd that come from? You know, <laughs> that we'd just start laughing. He would come up with stuff, and um, he, he and he was a wonderful guy. He was kind of like my uncle. I spent a lot of time with Jerry. Loved him, and he was a genius. And as was Gary, and Gary, you know, had this kind of mind for it as well where we would have all these um sessions uh, after we would do a rehearsal uh, of the show a run through of the show and then gary and the writers that were watching and then we all be around a table and i used to love those sessions because you know we'd have a problem and 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 gary go well you know what if uh, if ralph did instead of doing this what if uh, chachi you know and he would just come up with something and we'd all start laughing and it would be a brilliant solution to the problem, fix it, make it funnier. And this would happen over and over again. So, I mean, I, I had that bird's eye seat and I used to, I relished that. I was sitting there doing those note sessions and hearing, you know, all the ideas flowing back and forth of how to improve this, fix this. Then the actors would have ideas. It was a real collaboration, but Jerry and, Jerry's history with with Gary, you know, was really special, and and they brought it to to our show, and and that was one of the reasons we were as as successful. You know, one of the reasons for sure. Absolutely, and it was a great uh, combination of of actors and writers, and uh, and of course uh, producers yeah. and directors. And we'll be back uh, to discuss more with Don Most in our last section on everything old's new again. <laughs> This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. This is a very special place. They say once every hundred years in this spot, Donnie Most rises from the mist. Uh, I think that's just a legend. Well, that's because you're... <gasps> Look! Donnie Most, Donnie Most, he was round. Actually, it's Don Most now. <laughs> Welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. Douglas Viviani with David Cohen and I remember that. Don Most himself. Uh, you know, that was so uh, pleasurable to see you just appear in that, so to speak, out of nowhere and uh, and be able to smile and have a sense of humor. Um, how did that come about? What was that all about? <laughs> yeah, my agent called me one day and said, uh, that Seth MacFarlane had called and they were going to be doing an episode where they had this bit, this little scene where they were going to uh, do something about me and they 
it said, here's the material. Uh, we'd love Don to come in and do his own voice on it. They knew they didn't know how I'd react. They thought, you know, maybe I would I would be a little you know, taken back by it and not want to do it. And they said, look, we're going to do it anyway. We'd rather have <laughs> Don do it. But if he doesn't want to do it, we're going to do it, you know. So um, I, I said, let me read it. So I read it, and I thought it was very, very funny. I mean, I, you know, I had changed my name, you know, um, after Happy Days because I was trying to, you know, I was gone by Donnie when I was a kid, and when I was still 20, so I was still Donnie, I guess. And But then trying to get away from the, you know, I didn't want to just be, just be typed as that one character. I wanted to have a career beyond that. And I thought, I'm an adult now. I'll go with Don Most. It'll help. But when, so when they sent that to me, I, I definitely saw the humor in it. I thought it was very funny. And I said, oh, I'm definitely going to do my own voice. So I went in. And then when I got to see even more of what they were doing, it was like, wow, they did this whole production with the <laughs> song. And I thought it was fantastic. You know, and it, Still funny when I watch it. It's very funny. Yeah, we get a smile, get a smile just listening to that, not even seeing it, a little piece of the yeah. family family guy there. I want to remind everyone that coming out soon in the fall, and that's around the corner, Lost Heart, a movie that Don Most is in. There's also, take a look and go to YouTube and look up viral vignettes, and if you look up Don Most's name, you're going to get a few of those, whether you did some vignettes, some fun vignettes from, from where you are, right? And how did that work yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. They were like they were like ten minute episodes with two actors that are pretty well known. I did one with Robert Wall. Um, you know, we play cousins in it, and because of the quarantine, we can't see each other in person, so we're talking to each other, and it's a really funny scene. And then I did one with Gail O'Grady, wonderful actress, and she uh, in it. I'm talking. She plays my therapist, and I'm talking to my therapist, and we're doing it, for, you know, from home or you know, like these video medical con you know that you do it was very funny so i'm sorry check it out on youtube viral vignettes viral vignettes absolutely david cohen i think you have a question i apologize yeah don i'm, I'm just curious you, you you talked about the name change or, or the shortening of the first name after right. after happy days years what what were those first years like when you had left the show just personally and i guess professionally for you yeah, it was tricky it was very tough i'm yeah, I left. My contract was up after the seventh season, and um, it was a tough decision, but I'd been doing the show for seven years, playing the one character. I felt the scripts were were not uh, as, you know, they were starting to go down, and it's hard to maintain it after five years. Uh, Ron Howard uh, decided not to renew the same year as when he was pursuing directing, and, and um, I just felt like it's time to move on, and I told my agent at the time, you know, I, I didn't want to do another series. I wanted to try to do film and just film and theater. Back then, it was very difficult to do that. Uh, today, it's very dif different. There's more of a bridge between the mediums of television, film, people who are doing one go to the other, back and forth. Right. Back then, it, it was like if you were in TV, you know, you didn't, it was very hard to then, if you were known for TV, to then break into film. But I wanted to try, you know, I was 27, but it, I hit like a brick wall. You know, I, I told him I only I don't want to go up for television, just film and, and and some theater. So I went like the first six months, I didn't even have one audition, you know, not wow. a, I couldn't get uh, an interview. And I had a big agent. So, uh, you know, I did some theater to, to keep keep working. And sure. and and that was great. But then, you know, after a couple of years, I. I then said to my agent, okay, you know, I guess I'll do some television, you know, because let's consider television because I wasn't even getting the chance to audition for films for the most part. So it was tough. It was tough. And then, then you know, a couple of years had gone by and it was like, well, where was he been doing, you know? Um, <laughs> so it, then it became hard. But then, but I chipped away, you know, I, I, I kept working. I, I wound up getting a lot of guest starring roles in different TV shows and then a film here and there, um, and then some independent films that I started building more and more of doing some indie films. And, and that, I think, started opening things up for me more and more, where people were seeing me in different things. And, and that's why, especially in the last few years, it's really opened up. And I think also because of not only the body of work, and then I did the recurring role in Glee, which I think helped, but these indie films... I'm doing more and more, and um, like in these last few years, some really interesting roles 
probably because I'm older now and and so I'm a, there's more time and space from happy days. So um, MBF is a very different role for me and a lost heart as well. Um, and then I did another one called Cult Cartel. I'm not sure what's happening with that film, but I play a polygamist in that. You know, I wow. play play a pretty not not a very nice character. So um, that's you know I love the diversity and and it seems to be op- it was really opening up and then and then the COVID mm. hit and then we couldn't do anything so right. it was frustrating. I'm hoping I want to get back into it soon like we all do exactly and and some of that uh, experience brought you to uh, our star trek reference if you listen to our show we know there's a star trek reference almost every show and let's hear a couple seconds here of uh, don most on the voyage ask them to give us some privacy you're dismissed why is this man here dysphoria syndrome a uh, little piece of a little something that just to prove that we did our research oh yeah it's dr caden <laughs> Dr. Kane, I did a two-parter uh, called Workforce, and I played sort of the, uh, you know, definitely the villain, I, I would say, of, right. the, of the piece. <laughs> and and <laughs> was, what was it like to act on a different set to be, you know, a, an existing show, and now you're the guest star? And I don't know if you had an experience with uh, Kate Mulgrew, and I know Jerry Ryan was in that scene, and they were kind of a little bit, uh, had a little animosity here and there, from what I understand. Did you feel any of that, or how was your experience to be, be able to uh, guest star on a show for two seasons, two I episodes? I don't remember th- that I was in the scene with Kate. I really was happy to be on the show, and and the cast was great. I had no problem. I didn't detect anything. Um, I was not aware of, of anything going on. Um, the 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 only problem I had was that on that particular two parter, there was you know a difference of opinion among uh, the director was, and I were do, doing one thing, and then all of a sudden one of the exec producers came over and had a very different uh, way of looking at it. And and then I kind of got caught in the middle. It was like, well, you know, you want me to do it this way now? A, a different approach to the character. And and it threw me. Um, so it was like, you know, you have a director and then an exec producer telling you something different. And that that was not it was not conducive to the best kind of work. And, and as a result, I, I, I wasn't thrilled with I, I was kind of stuck in the middle. I didn't quite know where to go with that. Right. I did. I, 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 that was the one problem I had, but I didn't detect any problems w- w- uh, on the set with the actors. Okay, and and from the outside looking in, we couldn't detect uh, the difficulties you had. It was a a, a great t- two episode, you know, vignette, so oh. to speak. Uh, and I really enjoyed seeing you as a. You had a little prosthetic there too. You had to wear, which is a little bit of aggravation, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but kinda cool. it kind of disguised you, so I had, you know, I kind of listened. I go, wait, who is that? You know, all of a sudden you recognize who the person is. But it did a great job on that show and, and oh, terrific you. career at this point. And and we're looking forward to seeing Man's Best Friend this weekend any weekend amazon prime anywhere you can get movies uh maybe pick up the, the cd the most mostly swinging i really yeah. enjoyed the uh, uh yeah, the that's performances on, that's on itunes and amazon you can get uh mostly swinging beautiful and then youtube viral vignettes and of course look for in the future we'll let you know about lost heart when it comes out this fall uh don most thank you so much for spending so much time with us here yeah. on don, everything thank you. Do again. Pleasure. david pleasure is mine thank you and douglas thank you very much absolutely we'll see you again i'm sure i hope right here right now and everything old is do again come on back next week These days, the news is full of teen suicide, drug and alcohol abuse, bullying. It's depressing and concerning, but there is hope. WWE Intercontinental Champion Mark Merrow. Champion Choice is a live presentation that empowers students to make positive choices and live their best life. I teach students how to live a drug-free life, prevent bullying, avoid peer pressure, and keep negative people out of their lives. We are defined by our choices. There is hope. To schedule a Champion of Choices presentation for your school or organization, visit thinkpaz.org. That's thinkpaz.org.
Report. Well, this is Karen Allen from Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Man, and I'm here to tell you about my wonderful store and website, KarenAllenFiberArts.com. It's KarenAllen-FiberArts.com. I carry all kinds of really unique gifts and women's clothing, lines from all over the world, from small studios that are things you won't see anywhere else. And if you're looking for a gift or something for yourself, please get in touch with us. We would love to help you find that special thing. That's Karen Allen dash fiberarts.com. You've been listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's pop culture entertainment talk show. Find us on the web at everything old is new again dot biz. That's dot biz. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station.